effective linguistic system. He's the creator and owner of halfpasshuman.com. You can also get his report, Alta report, from his website. Um, you can go right to his website. I'm going to put all the links at the bottom of this video so you know where to go. I am very, very happy to have Cliff on the X22 Report Spotlight. Cliff, welcome to the Spotlight. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks for being here. Let's just start off um, explaining what predictive linguistics is and what you actually do with the information that you get around the internet. Just give a brief summary of what you do. Predictive linguistics is uh, an art or a science or um, you know a hobby <laughs> that I invented in in the early '90s. Uh, it is based on the idea that all humans are psychic, and that we most of us are unaware of our psychic impressions uh, at any given time, and that these psychic impressions wish to come out, and that they do so through our brain, uh, forcing us uh, subtly to make different changes or, or to to choose different words than we may not uh, uh, than we would have otherwise. Humans uh, in English have a tendency to have about a hundred thousand words internalized, but any given year. We might only use 15,000 or less, and in any given week, week after week after week, our selection set that we would normally use might be, say, anywhere from 1,500 words to maybe 5,000. And so, uh, and then the outliers is what I was interested. Why did a particular person choose this word at that time when they were, you know, when their normal habit was to use a different form or expression? And so I came across this idea, and then the internet really started um, developing with HTML coming out of CERN in 93. And I was right there at uh, Microsoft where it fired off and we started playing around with Mozilla. And then I thought, ooh, this is interesting. And started, uh, I was doing uh, SQL database stuff and, and, large-scale projects for um, uh, some companies anyway, and so set up my own servers and started mining the net uh, in 97 when I did my first run and aggregated all this information. My intent was, because I was just, I'd been struck dumb by a brilliant idea in the early 90s, uh, was to follow up on that idea. The brilliant idea was, aha, uh, stock market does not care. It doesn't give a damn about fundamentals or any of this. It's all driven by emotion. And so I thought, and basically lunacy and fantasy. And so I thought, okay, if I can get a step ahead of that emotion and tap into the trend of the lunacy and fantasy and where it's going this particular day, I could make some money. <laughs> that, that was my motivation on it. But I uh, fired it off and I, and I, universe had me make an interesting mistake because my first target, so to speak, was this thing called Sun, Stanford University Network, which was a hot stock in the 90s. And I was just going to see how it worked with that. The data came back and started spewing out all kinds of stuff about sun, the big scary ball in the sky, and I was hooked. <laughs> and I, I never went back to look at stocks after that. So I wanted to start off with um, the election. Now, you predicted that Trump or your algorithm and your information came in that said that Trump was going to win. Um, we know that the election most likely was manipulated in some way, but everything that you looked at said that he was going to win. Here we are after the elections, and we see that around the country, people are protesting right now. They're a little upset. Uh, other people are happy. From your data, are you getting any type of information on the mood of the country or the mood of the government officials? What are you seeing right now? When I first started doing the runs that brought up um, this particular period of time, the uh, dominant, okay, everything I do is in set uh, data sets. Each uh, set is linguistic, so I don't get a chart or any of that kind of thing. But I have a this critter I called the emotive reduction engine where I assign values for emotions to words and so I can get an emotional tone. And I use that emotional tone with this vast list of words that is the, the lexicon that supports the work. And I can get a dominant emotional tone, if you will. And so right at the moment, we're in a, in a dominant emotional tone that will extend at least until the morning of the 19th of confusion. Now, the confusion is uh, not about the uh, election results, but uh, basically about what it means and, and in many cases how it came to be. So uh, we have confusion on one side where um, the uh, uh, manipulators of the markets, government, uh, media, etc., just as they did in Brexit, had all of their um, technologies and their tools 
aimed at a particular outcome, and they are now confused as to how that outcome uh, did not arise. And, but their confusion is not what our data sets pick up, because we're looking at a vast um, amount of uh, aggregated data going towards a more uh, social body or general mood kind of thing. And we're in a point of confusion where those individuals that were um, uh, emotionally manipulated, desperate to uh, see a particular vision fulfilled, um, uh, are confused because it didn't occur. So, uh, imagine a situation, and it'll sound extremely harsh, okay? I'll tell this to everybody up front. It's going to sound extremely harsh if you were involved in this. But imagine a situation where the deep state, with all of its technology, in, including technology that is uh, designed for and deliberately focused on mass mind control, was aimed at a particular form of a conclusion. They wanted a particular conclusion, which was business as usual, that was going to lead on a particular path to uh, ultimately what they thought would be a limited nuclear war with Russia uh, in the Middle East and in that area. So that was the deep, that was the plan of those individuals that are moving the deep state along. I'm not saying the civil servants, I'm not saying these individuals uh, uh, desired that plan. I'm saying that they were part of a machine, an organization that was moving in that direction, and those people at the top were pushing us that way. Now, in order for that to occur, we're looking at basically mathematics. And let me divert for a second. In the 50s, there was this marvelous science fiction writer, Isaac Asimov. He wrote a series of books called The Foundation Trilogy. In there, he prophesied, so to speak, the sort of the work I do at the moment in an in a, in a analog of it. And But they came across, and he developed this idea of a mathematics involved in social engineering. And the Chinese went ahead, and they have uh, indeed... Uh, perfected or are on the pro in the process of perfecting that mathematics. And if you read Chinese literature, you discover that their social engineering is very focused. And they know that, for instance, if they're going to achieve a certain outcome in a uh, racially mixed community that they're going to take over, they have to have at least 21% Han or um, racially Han Chinese in control in that environment. 19% won't do, 23 is is too much, it's fine, but it's just too much, you don't need it. And so they're that precise about it. So the mathematics are that precise. The deep state had a particular set of mathematics involved, but in order to achieve this mathematics, you can look at a various, you can look at a, an equation that says one man can change the world given enough time and enough energy or unique happenstance. Uh, eliminating universe and providence and unique happenstance, for one person to change the world, you've got to have as, as much energy as it takes that one person to affect the other 7 billion people in the world or enough of them that they can change. However, you get a certain start of a, of a ratio and you can start doing things. The United States went into a revolution in the 1700s with 3% committed to that goal. That's all it took and it, and it was successful. The powers that be, on the other hand, had a very different problem. They had to get a, um, uh, a, a vision accomplished that had only, perhaps, maybe uh, a small fraction of a small fraction of 1% that was truly dedicated to that vision, which was the continuation of the uh, oligarchy and the hegemony of the dollar and, and the things the way they were. In order to, to do that, therefore, they had to convince a large body of people to also share that vision. When these people were convinced, they uh, will necessarily crash now that that vision has not occurred. And they will not understand why they are crashing or what actually has occurred to them. Okay, And this is where this in information becomes harsh. It is my opinion that the entrainment technology that has been developed in uh, the deep, dark uh, UFO worlds um, and secrecy of the past 60 years, the, the theoretic or the um, labeled Cold War era, etc., which was all about hiding UFO reverse engineering and not about war with Russia. But uh, it's my opinion that that technology was used to try and engineer this particular vision to occur. And unfortunately, the people that were susceptible to that technology have just been cut loose from it. So they're very much like um, uh, people that were on a mental support system that was involved, that was energetic, and all of a sudden all that energy is gone. And it's because the powers that be failed and they just turned off all the equipment. It's all, it's all over. And this is why we're seeing this particular reaction. And this reaction will continue at least through the morning of the 19th. 
this the reaction is also going to be uh, global uh, because you'll notice that the effects of this were media driven and so we have people that were uh, desperately anti trump repeating the same um uh, homogenic um, keywords, their their selection of xenophobic, racist, and misogynist. That's all they say, xenophobic, racist, and misogynist, over and over and over again. And that these people, when you question them on them, can't provide you any details of it and get really weirded out by it all. And you see this on the YouTube videos now. But th these individuals in Britain, throughout Europe, they were as affected. And a lot of these people were sort of like unintended victims of this entrainment technology. And the uh, snapback, the release, is going to cause problems, this state of confusion. Now, there's also other aspects of the confusion, which is the, as I pointed out, <laughs> the powers that be at the top wondering basically, okay, what the hell happened? And then the next question that's going to occur to them is how do we react and how do we uh, survive? It's not cover our asses anymore. It's survive. If you notice from the WikiLeaks, uh, Hillary actually said, you know, that uh, in very graphic language that uh, we're all going to hang from nooses if if that bastard wins. And so uh, that bastard is one, paraphrasing. And so the next step is going to be nooses. And it's going to be um, uh, to the point where these individuals realize that the crime uh, spree is is finished. It's over. There's been a, a turning. The problem for them is that the, uh, as Taoists say, you know, we change at the point of the most extreme and just coincidentally here we are at the point of the fourth turning within the population of the United States at a uh, deep level that coincided with this. It wouldn't have mattered who they actually, uh, who actually emerged. It's a situation of um, historical uh, energetic uh, impetus, and someone would have emerged to fill the role that Trump occupies now, uh, it's not if not necessarily him. And it's my understanding of how these things work, that if Trump had been taken out early on and had shown huge prog uh, progress and so forth and had been assassinated, then we would have had someone else arrive uh, that would have also taken on this particular role at this time to get us to this particular point. Uh, so the fact that the powers that be saw him as their stooge, uh, basically he um, um, uh, uh, sort of a rope-a-dope, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that's and that's where we're at now. So we're in a state of confusion that's going to go on. It's going to hit the markets very hard, and then we're going to enter into a very large deflationary event in early uh, 2017 that will. Um, uh, royal the country in uh, sort of a temporal echo of what happened when uh, right after Reagan was inaugurated. In your report, I noticed that you said something about uh, government employees getting fired or committing suicide and bankers being dismissed and fired. Um, are, are you seeing there, that there's going to be a wave of, let's say, cleaning house and people getting scared and jumping ship? Is that what you're talking about? Cor correct. That is, uh, that's true uh, more in the um, civil service side, more in the government side of that particular statement. Uh, so, yeah, that's the, um, uh, the motivation on that part of it is um, not cleaning house, but trying to eliminate uh, witnesses. That's really what it's going to come down to. Is the powers that be the shadow government, the central bank, uh, the deep state, do they have those are all those are all different by the way you're you're speaking yeah. with a linguist linguist and I don't want to be pedantic but uh, okay. so the the whole mass of them correct if you want to talk about that but if you're if you're uh, we shouldn't use each of those words to to try and refer to uh, a single entity let's just talk about the central bankers right now do they have any plans um, for the economy I mean is the economy still in terrible shape I mean is is anything going to improve with Trump, um, what do you? Oh, cer certainly, uh, the latter is true. Okay, now let's uh, again not to be pedantic, but let's separate what the central bankers do from the economy, because the central bankers at the moment are sucking the life out of the economy with their um, uh, paper financial system. The two are separate. The economy is the, all the trades and transactions that uh, we do together. 
uh, uh, millions and millions and millions of us doing trillions of those things across the time of a year equals our economy. So the central bankers are not in charge of our economy. They can no more affect my ability to, to trade or barter my old tire from my uh, trooper to my neighbor than, than they can uh, cause it to rain here. So the um, – the central bankers and their financial system are in a deep world of hurt, and that is really sick, and it's going to continue to be sick. But the economy, on the other hand, at a, um, a much more base level, uh, is going to continue the way it's always continued, in spite of the fact that we're uh, nearing the end of the repression of the central bank era, at least within this country. In your report, you talked about baby boomers getting kicked out of their homes we're seeing these huge mansions being abandoned. I mean, are, are we looking at some type of crisis heading or our sure, way? Or sure. Yeah, that's the deflationary event. Okay, so here's – and actually, I probably shouldn't use the word deflationary because I don't know that that's meaningful to most people. But let's call it about a debt evaporation event. So here's the – or a liquidity evaporation event, or as we call it in the data sets, a credit freeze. Because here's what's going to happen. The banks alone currently exist not because they own anything, nor because all of us are paying off our loans and they make a little bit of uh, money on top of that. And so they're the happy, congenial uh, community banker that no longer exists. These individuals, the whole structure makes their money because an entity in Washington, D.C. creates the digits and hands them the digits and then they go out and they tell us those digits are worth something and they shove them around in databases and, and this kind of thing, um, frenetically creating activity but no result. So our problem at the moment is that the banking system the um, uh, glue that holds all of that together is what's coming uh, unglued, and it will at some point reveal the economy. We'll all stand around and look at each other and say, wow, let's go and do something, because now this repression will have been uh, released. But that's not yet. That's maybe a year or two years away. In between now and then, the uh, re uh, oppressors, uh, the occupying force that is the central bank that has taken over the United States, bear in mind we've destroyed them. The people have risen up and destroyed central banks twice before in this in this uh, nation. Right. And we're about to do it a third time. But before we get there, these guys are going to create vast numbers of these digits and do all kinds of manipulation and try and get us to all get on their side. And it's just not going to work. A lot of the confusion from, um, as you read from the report, is going to be within the upper ranks trying to figure out what to do and to how to sell us into their next uh, scheme. So here's the thing. We are dealing with sociopaths, all right? At the very top are the psychopaths. They're, they're the ones running around that say, okay, you know, you looked at me wrong. Have him killed. All right, the sociopaths are the people that do the killing because they're afraid not to. But the sociopaths, being the people that do the implementation, are bound by their sociopathic nature. They require willing victims. They, they, sociopaths are basically cowards. If you call them on it, they freak out. They don't have a defense mechanism inbuilt in their, in their um, uh, mental uh, structure of the world, and they react badly. And so uh, the sociopaths are reacting badly now because the willing victims are not w so willing anymore. The vast majority of us don't buy their um, um, scheme anymore and are wondering basically what the hell's going to happen. Now, uh, uh, they are in a position of are going to have to try and sell us uh, scheme after scheme after scheme. And um, they are in a position where they can't not do that. They can't just stop and say, well, we, we screwed up, guys. You all are on your own. We're going to go off and, you know, uh, go on a cruise to Alcapoco or something while you guys figure it out. They can't do that kind of thing. They must continue because of the nature of what's going to happen. But here's their real problem. Every time they do something new, it makes more and more people fall into the camp of not buying their uh, vision anymore. So so it's uh, truly beyond um, ineffective. It's now into generating uh, their own uh, demise. Some of them may be smart enough to realize this, but I doubt it. As you realize from what the data is saying in the reports, we have a very rough couple of years ahead as the central bank dies and we have to um, get rid of it. The analogy I'm using with friends around here in emails and stuff is that the dinosaur is dead. Uh, the last of the living blood is just now passing through its little tiny brain, but it's going to take us a long time to shove the thing over. As we go through this, um, do you see uh, like foreclosures in homes? Do you pe do you see people losing yeah. oh, sorry. jobs? Sorry, let me uh, let me go right to that point. Oh, okay. The, 
on the, your last question in the housing, as the central bankers uh, uh, dry up, they pinch off the um, the flow of this um, free money to everybody, you know, meaning the other banks, and the banks therefore will start instituting, as they did in the 1930s, this provision that's in all the contracts for houses that says, hey, we can call this note due if we need to. And it, that's really what it is. It's a long and involved, but it's still in all the mortgages. And it says, at our need, we can make 100% of this mortgage due right now. They're going to do it in mass. That's how uh, they took vast numbers of properties in the Midwest, vast areas of farming land that were aggregated into huge tracts and sold to corporations were seized with that particular provision uh, in 32 when the when the bonds went and the bond fiasco then. We are right in the middle of another one of these bond fiascos and it starts right away in terms of the need of the liquidity for the banks. So expect them to start trying to make as much in the way of the uh, profit or, or liquidity for their institution by property seizures early next year in the 30s. It took them about six months to have something implemented. They may do it far faster now because they have the uh, modern communications. Isn't this going to make people like really angry calling everyone's loans, you know, at the same time? Uh, people, uh, I mean, we're, we're going to see riots. If they yeah. And we, and we saw them, we saw them in the thirties and the military was called out to shoot people. This was the time in the 30s when um, uh, factories were taken over by workers that were dispossessed because of the credit freeze that occurred then, a, a.k.a. a deflationary event as we hear it in the, in the reports. And it leads to the, the government having to call out the military because you start getting strong opposition to these immoral acts. And uh, their uh, response in the 1930s was in the area I live up here was to shoot people on bridges south of me uh, about 40 miles where unionists had decided that was enough. They were going to try and forestall a uh, foreclosure sale. See, they still have to go through the um, legalistic uh, component of it. The robo signings were their attempt at the bank level to avoid the local sheriffs and avoid the local problems. If they can just send you a note saying you're foreclosed, we'll be there Tuesday to kick your ass out. And there's no, uh, you know, meeting on the courthouse steps to sell the foreclosed property as a quote formality back to the bank, which is usually what happens. Then under those circumstances, uh, there isn't the huge giant outcry. So they've done everything they can in the last 15 years to engineer a system where they don't have to encounter that local opposition. I don't know how it is in the East, but out here in the West, they haven't been very successful. And so they will get mass opposition. And that's why I say in the, in the data sets, it's coming out about half of the people are just going to walk away, just acquiesce to this. Uh, I don't know if the, it's a lack of support structure, their age or what the deal is, but uh, the other half are going to be rather miffed. And there's going to be a lot of bad behavior. Is the government going to react to these people that are angry? Uh, because I can see in certain cities and certain areas that um, things will get completely out of control. And what will the government, I mean, does your data sets and your information um, tell you how the government is going to control we, the situation? No, we get we get details. And what you're asking is uh, basically for me to describe an outcome. And so you're talking to somebody that deals in things temporally. So it's like, on what day are we describing this? You know, uh, what day do you want an answer for that? Or are we talking at what point in a month? Because this is the way it is with humans. Um, there's always dynamic activities. So this is won't happen all in a single day. It's going to happen to individual banks as they uh, need the liquidity. Their response is basically going to be the same, but it's not going to be so ubiquitous that, say, all of the mortgages are called by Wells Fargo on a particular day all across the nation. It's not going to work that way. But at some point along the way, sometime next year, we can all look back and say, oh, look, most of the nation is now involved in this uh, generalized warfare uh, with uh, illegal foreclosures as the banks are desperately trying to save themselves because the other components of the their supposed safety plan, bail-ins and bail-outs, are not working. Do you see banks closing? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And vast, vast numbers. And it's going to just be absolutely horrific. When it goes, uh, it's not going to be like the... Um, uh, this won't be like what happened in the 1930s, okay? Let's take as a... Uh, 
uh, our basic model, what happened in my area, Olympia, in the 1930s. There were 19 banks when we went into the uh, Depression in 1929, and there was one when we came out. So 18 of those banks and credit unions and savings and loans failed in that period of time from 1929, and let's just call it 1942 to say we were nominally out of the Depression here. All right, During that period of time, they failed. We don't have that situation now. We don't have a situation where we have 18 independent banks that were loosely connected to a centralized banking structure. Now we have an octopus, a giant um, banking system that feeds off of a central heart and a central brain. So big banks will fail and they'll take out all the regionals. Now what our data showed about I want to say maybe five or six months back, maybe it was longer than that. I just don't remember because I write these things and I just can't remember. I'd go crazy. Uh, But sometime back, uh, the data sets were talking about how the failure would occur and that it would start at the mid tier, at the regionals, that they would go first, that banks that had, you know, several hundred branches were maybe across a couple of states. They would be the ones that would be bled dry first and the chaos would start with them, ATM closures and all of this sort of thing. They were, they're going to try and maintain the big five as long as they can. As I say, the dinosaur just doesn't know it's dead because the last of the blood still being pumped up its neck. So you said a couple of things. Okay, so you said a, a credit freeze um, a little while back as we were speaking. And when you say a, a credit freeze, does that mean that supplies and goods will not get to stores? I mean, will... Correct. Correct. Okay. That's a side. Of, that's a side effect. Of that's it, a side effect. Okay. We've we've had the credit freeze in the data for a couple of years at least, maybe longer than that. It was in very long term data. Now we're getting into the uh, details as we move closer to the event. That's basically how our system works. For some reason, well, no, it sort of makes sense in a way. Humans are psychic about. Uh, some humans are psychic about events in a long term way, and there we get hints about stuff that might happen three and four and five and ten years out. The closer we get to it, apparently more and more humans are in the same wavelength and they start picking it up and we get greater number of leaks. Therefore, we get a little bit more detail. That's like our short-term data. And as we get real close to it, lots of people can sense it. And so they start uh, triggering their psychic impressions and those come out. And so we get a little bit more details. So that's sort of the the mechanism by which it goes. So we've had credit freeze for a long time. And uh, fundamentally, one of the major side effects that you and I will experience is what we call the just-in-time failure, the just-in-time supply system. You have to think of uh, 1940s, end of the war, uh, Peter Drucker goes to Japan. Uh, he creates in Japan because they were just destroyed. He helps uh, MacArthur rebuild the country, and they decide on a model called the just-in-time supply system. And that's where the carriers, the truckers, basically, are your warehouses. You just don't build warehouses anymore. You sell off all the property, and you devote the money to a different system. That's where we're at now. The Western world adopted this model over the 50s, and it's now going to fail. It depends on ever-increasing cheaper energy, ever-increasing cheaper credit. Neither of those is true anymore. Uh, so we won't be able to do that. In fact, it's already started to fail. The top shipper, second shipper um, uh, globally, Han Jin, uh, number two shipper of goods around the planet, is in bankruptcy and in chaos, and its ships are not hauling anymore. Doesn't seem to matter because no one's buying so much anymore here in the U.S. because of our problems with our money being so destroyed. But the credit freeze will take that up to the next level as number three, four, five, and six, and number one shippers fail. And then when they fail, they'll be failing under the impetus of the uh, – they don't have credit to pay their employees nor – to front the fuel costs, et cetera. So we're going to see real chaos as loads get, uh, ships and loads and crews become, you know, um, abandoned and stuck in various ports and the system breaks down all around the planet. And so that will be a very major concern is the just-in-time supply system is going to fail. That's what the government's going to be responding to. They're not going to do much in the way of trying to deal with the foreclosure issues insofar as what we see in our data because Imagine, okay, uh, here's a scenario. Now, I'm not saying that all of the description here will be accurate, but this will give you an idea of what we're sort of looking at. Imagine a situation where Trump's being installed. He's not bringing in cronyism. He's not bringing in a giant mass of uh, crony-connected deep politicians. Therefore, these guys don't know a damn thing about running a giant government, which is not like running a a real business. And so there's going to be a period of adjustment that will probably last 18 months or longer because the deep state is 
going to be obstructing and fighting these guys every step of the way. And then when they're taking a break, a break from the fight, the deep state's going to be trying to pull the rug out from underneath them, just standing there. It's going to be very vicious at that level. These individuals will not be able to address, the, that is to say, the people that are being brought into a new government will not be able to address the real problems that are besetting uh, the populace in their fight with the occupying banks. And so at the same time, we're going to have the just-in-time supply system crash because those same banks are the ones that fund this weird credit system that gets the McFries to you and, you know, uh, puts, um, uh, you know, uh, potatoes on the table and that kind of thing, right? What you're saying is that the government is not going to really help the people during this period of time. Let's let's also stop for a second and be okay. real pedantic, and let's start talking in words other than a single word to identify the ruling structure. So okay. the the ruling structure is composed of many many different layers that are that are huge. So there's going to be people that are at the top that will certainly be freaking out about everything that's going on and trying to do everything they can. But I don't really necessarily, and they they are what we sort of think of, of when we use that word government. But government's got a huge connotation. It's everything from the, the uh, El Presidente all the way down to the FEMA guy that's either going to give you a bottle of water or throw you into a camp. And so what are we actually talking about? I'm wrapping my brain around all of this and everything that you're saying here. You also mentioned something about ATMs shutting down. Does that mean we're going to have a cash crisis? Correct. As part of the liquidity freeze, but not not because they're going to outlaw cash or any of that. They're desperate to do that because the banksters don't want to admit uh, well, let me stop and say humans are really funny. We always bring on ourselves because of the nature of universe, that challenge that we need to face. And so here the bankers are trying desperately to destroy cash. And if you think if you have all of these people out on the Internet that are prof um, uh, offering ideas as to why this is the case, that they need more control, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if you only have uh, digital things, they can control you down to your your nads and, you know, pull you on the short hairs by threatening to do away with your bank account. And none of that is true or it's all true, but it's none of it is meaningful. The bankers are trying to uh, destroy cash as their part of the system because they're vulnerable to it. They're hugely vulnerable to it because there's only a little tiny bit of um, real money these days and a huge amount of uh, derivatives on that, that real money that actually exists. And so the um, uh, the problems that they have are cash based, but not the way we think we're going to have a cash crisis and it's because there is not going to be enough money, actual currency circulating through the real economy to support their paper games anymore. They were trying to get us all to shift into their virtual SIM world and play with their SIM money 100% of the time and get away from the cash that really is the underpinning. If you look at this thing called base money supply, you see how vulnerable we are. We have a population that's uh, hugely inflated. Uh, it's twice the size as it was in 1947. We have a debt structure that's perhaps 100 times inflated over what it was in 1947, but we only have 2% more actual circulating money going on in, in society, and that's where economy actually exists. And what they were hoping to do was to speed up um, uh, circulation by making it all digital. And they've got us all into a digital world, but they're still dependent on that base money and it's got them kind of, um, got them by the short hairs. And so we're going to run into a big crunch here, a big credit freeze at the same time that we find we're cash strapped. If you look at what's happening in Egypt, right? Egypt is having a huge currency crisis at the moment. Why? Because there's not enough physical dollars in the country to support their uh, uh, derivative debt structure now that they're getting into the deflationary wave. That same deflationary wave has caused hyperinflation in Venezuela, Argentina, Zimbabwe, Kenya, uh, Hungary, Uzbekistan, and so on. And, and now it's about ready to hit Europe. It'll hit here probably March or April of next year. We'll get, start getting into the hints of hyperinflation. Although I'm seeing temporal markers of it today. Let me just back up here for a sec. Sure. Uh, you're talking about a cash crisis, ATMs closing. So for those people listening, will they be able to get cash out? Do you see that, you know, are there going to be bank runs? Sure. 
So and, you're gonna... and, they'll, and they'll be able to get cash out for a short period of time, and then the ATMs will be empty. Nobody will, re, nobody will refill them, and and people will drive around with trucks and chains and stuff and rip them out of the mach- out of the walls just to scrounge through them and see if there might be a buck or two in them, just like happened in Argentina. So people are going to be desperate to find cash because it's just going to completely disappear. I mean, what you're saying, it sounds like it's just going to disappear. Well, um, yeah. Because they can't, but... get, they can't get to it. Correct. And see, here's what here's what's going to happen. Uh, right now, how often do you actually touch anything close to money in your daily life? I mean, you as an individual, mostly the people that are, say, uh, even in, in my age group, they're dealing with the plastic cards. And, and as the system locks up, you know, if your plastic card doesn't work, how are you going to pay for something at Safeway or Starbucks or someplace or buy gas or whatever? For a while, there will still be uh, stuff in the in the supply system. So we live right now without warehouses. So if we were to look at ourselves as a social body, we don't uh, have um, big, giant fat repositories lying around. We're existing on the fat that's being pumped around in our blood. And it's going to dry up. Our blood's going to get leaner. And so at that point... We don't have those extra reserves, and and you're going to run into this situation. It's hit all of the countries as the as the uh, dollar has uh, died. Uh, the, we're in an empire. The empire is based on the dollar, the way the British Empire was based on the pound sterling. We're replicating history. This happens all the time. Uh, empires die from the periphery. Part of our periphery was Argentina, Venezuela, Greece, you know, Hungary, all these countries that that were uh, dollar based on their own currency. So we see it there first. So let us not be surprised when it hits, you know, Florida, New Hampshire, California, et cetera, et cetera. So you also mentioned inflation, and we're seeing some inflation now. How bad is inflation going to get? I mean, what what are people going to see? I mean, from everything that you've been looking at, does that tell you like how bad it's going to get for the people? Uh, I get an emotional indicator. I get a lot of language about it, so I have a gut feeling. But uh, we don't, for instance, get charts. So imagine a situation where we're going to get a psychic leak from the future. It's going to happen to you today. You're going to choose a different word today. Put it into your your uh, email, not email, but on a on a forum somewhere today. We'll pick it up, and it'll get aggregated in, and it will affect our conclusions. Well, the way that that works in that chain, uh, people sometimes in a sense you can imagine they're sort of like getting psychic headlines as to what's going to happen in the future most numbers in our system we throw away because the internet is basically an uh, entirely a numeric system but linguistic numbers that float through for whatever reason people typing out the number 30 or or 13 or whatever uh, in an appropriate fashion and appropriate time to be swept into the data sets uh, that sort of thing does come through occasionally so it's not like I get a price for a hamburger two years from now I don't have that sort of thing for uh, inflation. I do occasionally have what we might say would be um, uh, impressions or whatever of screaming headlines. So imagine uh, we're a year from now, actually in July, August, or September, or October in that time frame. Uh, and there's going to be a giant headline that says Dow 125,000. So that gives you an idea. So what is the Dow today? It's at like 18,000 meaningless U.S. dollars. Well, a year from now, it'll be 125,000 meaningless U.S. dollars. But at that same time, that'll also be the price of an ounce of gold. Insofar as what our system is saying, it's not saying gold's going to be 125,000. It's saying that there's going to be parity about that time between an ounce of gold and the Dow. So if the Dow is up that high, inflation is going to be running Massively huge. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then, I mean, from everything that you've been telling us, to me, it sounds like the government is going to have a major problem on their hands. You Um, mean Trump and the people he brings in, or do you mean the deep state? uh, Because they're going to have different problems. I mean, let's talk about Trump and the people he brings in, because people are going to be screaming and yelling. And most likely, I'm thinking they're going to blame him for what is happening, because... We don't no. get that in the data. We don't have that really? component okay. of it. Yeah. Wow. Okay. We get their screaming and yelling. We get the riots. Okay. We get the uh, the rage. But, um, okay, now I've got to be circums- 
the circumspect here, okay? And I'll tell you that up front, that I've got to be restrictive on what I talk about because there's a lot of crap I don't know about how my own system works and I and I have to be careful not to break it. The very first time I ever made a public announcement about anything was about the um, uh, pending 9-11 attack and within days my system broke down because of giant circ- circuitous references I had never anticipated. As people started talking about it ahead of the event and, it, and my own system started picking it uh, up its own stuff. So I've got to be very careful about what I get into. However, okay. there's going to be a certain series of events that are forecast in the data that will pick up sometime, say, around December 15th, that will run through next year that will have a, uh, let's say, a counter uh, uh They'll be the other side of the teeter-totter emotionally and will draw our emotional um, uh, uh, focus that way as opposed to everybody blaming uh, the new crew for uh, the meltdown. So on the deep state end… Uh, they're, they're, they've got serious problems, really serious problems. Now, the deep state, we also have to identify government as being split into the people at the top, the political um, people, whether they're stooges of the powers that be or not. Um, And then we've got the entrenched civil servants. We have the shadow government that basically runs the entrenched civil servants, and the deep state is the entrenched civil servants, including military and including all the subcontractors, okay, that are at that level. But then there's that deeper part of it all, the, 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 um, uh, secrecy part of the government that is all 60 years of um, U- back engineering UFOs and their subcontractors. And they're the um, they're really good about their secrecy, so we only get vague hints about what their issues are. But the deep state is in a real uh, problem because they're going to face this uh, purge as the um, emotional uh, teeter-totter gets a... Uh, 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 moving back and forth in the dynamic few months ahead of us. Um, and at the same time, uh, the deep state is also going to be uh, reeling as their individual uh, people that the cogs in their organization uh, come under the same influences as the rest of us. So at some point, for instance, uh, you know, local government fails because people just say, well, uh, I can't live on this fake money anymore. No one accepts it or I'm not being paid. You know, my digits don't come here or once I've got the digits, I can't get them out. So what's the point? You know, I don't enjoy my work so much that I'm going to go and do it for months without getting paid. And we saw uh, the reverse of that in Greece where people kept going and going and going. And we saw it uh, in uh, South America going and going and going as their currencies and their countries were going down the the tubes. The uh, civil servants stayed on for months. And uh, it was the same as in the Weimar Republic. But in all of those cases, there were countries on the outside, on the border, that had more or less sound money. And so that sort of propped up the system. And there was uh, an expectation of business or work as usual. That will break down very quickly here. And not we won't be going months with uh, employees showing up to register your, your um, car at the DMV, even though they haven't been paid. How bad is this going to get? I mean, do you have a time frame where, um, you know, it's going to start and it's going to get worse and worse before it gets better? Do you do you break it sure, down sure. in that fashion? Yeah, yeah. It started in 1999. Actually, it started in 1972 when Nixon took us off the gold standard. So, but in term, yes, we we have. Um, I have a, an emotional progression at a finer level that shows the emotional tone of the period as it goes up and down, up and down, and so on. So I've got some idea of some of the spikes we're going to run into and, and these sorts of things. But um, that's a forecast of what the emotional tone will be like, not individual events or something that may be causing it. Uh, the system is very much Rube Goldberg in that sense, that we don't have a uh, complete um, painted picture. You know, there's a palette here with a few things and there's a brush and these kind of things in it. So we just have to make do with what we've got. Uh, it's going to get extremely bad, but it's going to depend on where you're at. Um, uh, relative to that in the in the U.S., some places are not going to do so, so bad. Hawaii won't do so bad. Guam won't do so bad. Um, you know, a lot of places will be uh, will be abandoning military bases. We won't have the people to the money to bring them back. That part of it's going to happen really suddenly. And uh, so it's going to cause real problems. That's been in the data sets. Uh, geez, that's like 2007 or so. Um, and we're getting into that time when all this will occur. Um, there's this book out 
written years and years and years ago. I don't know the guy's names or anything, but it, the book was called The Fourth Turning. And it gives a sort of an idea as to what we're going through in a broad stroke, because what's actually occurring a, at a social order is that our, our society is changing. Um, it's changing, and there was an attempt at that moment by the powers that be to cause a change towards their vision that we had discussed earlier, because when something's in motion, it's easier to make it shift than if you've got to lift it up and overcome the inertia and all of that. And so they were taking advantage, they thought, of this particular time of emotional turmoil. They had all the technology that they'd reverse engineered from the space alien ships, all this sort of thing, their entrainment technology, they were all set to go, and it failed on them, and they don't understand why. So their confusion is uh, going to play out in the um, uh, their interaction with each other and with the remnants of the control structure of the deep state. So now bear in mind, all of these people that had been working for the criminal class that had been doing evil acts now know they're at risk. They now know they've got to be scrubbed in order for those criminal class to get away. These people don't want to be scrubbed. There's a whole lot of them. So there's going to be a lot of people talking. There's going to be a lot of people that feel their best interest is to be a whistleblower or to, you know, confess their crimes that the people above them get nabbed and not them. There's going to be vast quantities of confusion. So if we describe government, we're not talking about a cohesive whole in any way, shape or form. We're going to be talking about a dynamic, um, a massive movement. In my last report, the conclusion was titled that, uh, uh, chrysalis begins with dynamic motion and people think of oh you know a, a caterpillar cocooning itself and coming out as a butterfly or a moth is really a neat thing and they just sit there and something happens underneath the cocoon but what they need to understand is that cocoon has to exist ahead of time you've got to or you've got to create that and if you've ever seen a caterpillar or a worm cocoon itself this is the most strangest uh dynamic motion you've ever seen as they try and wrap their bodies with this silk over and over and over again from within inside the silk as they're doing it so that's what we're going to go through the data sets are basically showing that the u.s is going to hit a 10-year to 12-year period very similar to what happened to the Soviet Union and that we will be transformed in this process as we come out of our own form of revolution against a control structure that has existed far too long and the population underneath is changing. The cool part about that change is that um, the nature of the people at the um, operational level of society will change. It won't be all these bloody lawyers anymore. We're just going to get rid of this whole mindset. And we're going to go back to people that uh, do things, uh, engineers and builders and that sort of thing. Cliff, thank you very much for being on the X-22 Report Spotlight. I really appreciate it. Once again, how can people get your report? Uh, halfpasthuman.com. Uh, we bring them out about once a month. Uh, I was going to try and do a mid-month report, but I just don't think I'll be able to get to it this month. Cliff, once again, thank you very much, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. linguistic system. He's the creator and owner of halfpasshuman.com. You can also get his report, Alta report, from his website. Um, you can go right to his website. I'm going to put all the links at the bottom of this video so you know where to go. I am very, very happy to have Cliff on the X-22 Report Spotlight. Cliff, welcome to the Spotlight. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks for being here. Let's just start off um, explaining what predictive linguistics is and what you actually do with the information that you get around the internet. Just give a brief summary of what you do. Predictive linguistics is uh, an art or a science or um, you know a hobby <laughs> that I invented in, in the early 90s. Uh, it is based on the idea that all humans are psychic and that we, most of us, are unaware of our psychic impressions uh, at any given time and that these psychic impressions wish to come out and that they do so through our brain, uh, forcing us uh, subtly to make different changes or, or to, to choose different words than we may not uh, uh, than we would have otherwise. Humans uh, in English have a tendency to have about 100,000 words internalized, but any given year, we might only use 15,000 or less. And in any given week, week after week after week, our selection set that we would normally use might be, say, anywhere from 1,500 words to maybe 5,000. 
And so, uh, and then the outliers is what I was interested. Why did a particular person choose this word at that time when they were, you know, when their normal habit was to use a different form or expression? And so I came across this idea and then the internet really started um, developing with HTML coming out of CERN in 93. And I was right there at uh, Microsoft where it fired off and we started playing around with Mozilla. And then I thought, ooh, this is interesting and started, uh, I was doing uh, SQL database stuff and, and, large-scale projects for um, uh, some companies anyway, and so set up my own servers and started mining the net uh, in 97 when I did my first run and aggregated all this information. My intent was, because I was just, I'd been struck dumb by a brilliant idea in the early 90s, uh, was to follow up on that idea. The brilliant idea was, aha, uh, stock market does not care. It doesn't give a damn about fundamentals or any of this. It's all driven by emotion. And so I thought, and basically lunacy and fantasy. And so I thought, okay, if I can get a step ahead of that emotion and tap into the trend of the lunacy and fantasy and where it's going this particular day, I could make some money. <laughs> that, that was my motivation on it. But I uh, fired it off and I, and I, to that goal, that's all it took. And it, and it was successful. The powers that be, on the other hand, had a very different problem. They had to get a, um, uh, uh, and a vision accomplished that had only perhaps maybe uh, a small fraction of a small fraction of 1% that was truly dedicated to that vision, which was the continuation of the uh, oligarchy and the hegemony of the dollar and, and the things the way they were. In order to, to do that, therefore, they had to convince a large body of people to also share that vision. When these people were convinced, they uh, will necessarily crash now that that vision has not occurred. And they will not understand why they are crashing or what actually has occurred to them. Okay, And this is where this in information becomes harsh. It is my opinion that the entrainment technology that has been developed in uh, the deep, dark uh, UFO worlds um, and secrecy of the past 60 years, the, the theoretic or the um, labeled Cold War era, etc., which was all about hiding UFO reverse engineering and not about war with Russia. But uh, it's my opinion that that technology was used to try and engineer this particular vision to occur. And unfortunately, the people that were susceptible to that technology have just been cut loose from it. So they're very much like um, uh, people that were on a mental support system that was involved, that was energetic, and all of a sudden all that energy is gone. And it's because the powers that be failed and they just turned off all the equipment. It's all, it's all over. And this is why we're seeing this particular reaction. And this reaction will continue at least through the morning of the 19th. This the reaction is also going to be uh, global uh, because you'll notice that the effects of this were media driven. And so we have people that were uh, desperately anti-Trump repeating the same um, uh, homogenic um, keywords, their, their selection of xenophobic, racist, and misogynist. That's all they say, xenophobic, racist, and misogynist, over and over and over again. And that these people, when you question them on them, can't provide you any details of it and get really weirded out by it all. And you see this on the YouTube videos now. But th these individuals in Britain, throughout Europe, they were as affected. And a lot of these people were sort of like unintended victims of this entrainment technology. And the uh, snapback, the release, is going to cause problems, this state of confusion. Now, there's also other aspects of the confusion, which is the, as I pointed out, <laughs> the powers that be at the top wondering basically, okay, what the hell happened? And then the next question that's going to occur to them is, universe had me make an interesting mistake because my first target, so to speak, was this thing called SUN, Stanford University Network, which was a hot stock in the 90s. And I was just going to see how it worked with that. The data came back and started spewing out all kinds of stuff about sun, the big scary ball in the sky, and I was hooked. <laughs> and I, I never went back to look at stocks after that. So I wanted to start off with um, the election. Now, you predicted that Trump or your algorithm and your information came in that said that Trump was going to win. Um, we know that the election most likely was manipulated in some way, but everything that you looked at said that he was going to win. Here we are after the elections, and we see that around the country, people are protesting right now. They're a little upset. Uh, other people are happy. From your data, are you getting any type of information on the mood of the country or the mood 
of the government officials. What are you seeing right now? When I first started doing the runs that brought up um, this particular period of time, the uh, dominant, okay, everything I do is in set uh, data sets. Each uh, set is linguistic, so I don't get a chart or any of that kind of thing. But I have a this critter I call the emotive reduction engine, where I assign values for emotions to words, and so I can get an emotional tone. And I use that emotional tone with this le- vast list of words that is the, the lexicon that supports the work. And I can get a dominant emotional tone, if you will. And so right at the moment, we're in a, do- in a dominant emotional tone that will extend at least until the morning of the 19th of confusion. Now, the confusion is uh, not about the uh, election results, but uh, basically about what it means and, and in many cases how it came to be. So uh, we have confusion on one side where um, the uh, uh, manipulators of the markets, government, uh, media, etc., just as they did in Brexit, had all of their um, technologies and their tools aimed at a particular outcome, and they are now confused as to how that outcome uh, did not arise. And But their confusion is not what our data sets pick up, because we're looking at a vast um, amount of uh, aggregated data going towards a more uh, social body or general mood kind of thing. And we're in a point of confusion where those individuals that were um, uh, emotionally manipulated, desperate to uh, see a particular vision fulfilled, um, uh, are confused because it didn't occur. So uh, imagine a situation, and it'll sound extremely harsh, okay? I'll tell this to everybody up front. It's going to sound extremely harsh if you were involved in this. But imagine a situation where the deep state, with all of its technology, in, including technology that is uh, designed for and deliberately focused on mass mind control, was aimed at a particular form of a conclusion. They wanted a particular conclusion, which was business as usual, that was going to lead on a particular path to uh, ultimately what they thought would be a limited nuclear war with Russia uh, in the Middle East and in that area. So that was the deep. That was the plan of those individuals that are moving the deep state along. I'm not saying the civil servants, I'm not saying these individuals uh, uh, desired that plan. I'm saying that they were part of a machine, an organization that was moving in that direction, and those people at the top were pushing us that way. Now, in order for that to occur, we're looking at basically mathematics. And let me divert for a second. In the 50s, there was this marvelous science fiction writer, Isaac Asimov. He wrote a series of books called The Foundation Trilogy. In there, he prophesied, so to speak, the sort of the work I do at the moment in a in a an analog of it. and But they came across and he developed this idea of a mathematics involved in social engineering. And the Chinese went ahead and they have uh, indeed uh, perfected or are on the pro- in the process of perfecting that mathematics. And if you read Chinese literature, you discover that their social engineering is very focused. And they know that, for instance, if they're going to achieve a certain outcome in a uh, racially mixed community that they're going to take over, they have to have at least 21% Han or um, racially Han Chinese in control in that environment. 19% won't do, 23 is is too much, it's fine, but it's just too much, you don't need it. And so they're that precise about it. So the mathematics are that precise. The deep state had a particular set of mathematics involved, but in order to achieve this mathematics, you can look at a various, you can look at an equation that says one man can change the world given enough time and enough energy or unique happenstance uh, eliminating universe and providence and unique happenstance for one person to change the world you've got to have as as much energy as it takes that one person to affect the other seven billion people in the world or enough of them that they can change however you get a certain start of a of a ratio and you can start doing things the united states went into a revolution in the 1700s with three percent committed how do we react and how do we uh survive it's not cover our asses anymore. It's survive. If you notice from the WikiLeaks, uh, Hillary actually said, you know, that uh, in very graphic language that uh, we're all going to hang from nooses if if that bastard wins. And so uh, that bastard is one, paraphrasing. 
And so the next step is going to be nooses, and it's going to be um, uh, to the point where these individuals realize that the crime uh, spree is is finished. It's over. There's been a, a turning. The problem for them is that the uh, as Taoists say, you know, we change at the point of the most extreme, and just coincidentally, here we are at the point of the fourth turning within the population of the United States at a uh, deep level that coincided with this. It wouldn't have mattered who they actually, uh, who actually emerged. It's a situation of um, historical, uh, energetic uh, impetus, and someone would have emerged to fill the role that Trump occupies now. Uh, it's not necess- if not necessarily him. And it's my understanding of how these things work that if Trump had been taken out early on and had shown huge prog- uh, progress and so forth and had been assassinated, then we would have had someone else arrive uh, that would have also taken on this particular role at this time to get us to this particular point. Uh, so the fact that the powers that be saw him as their stooge, uh, basically he... Um, um, uh, uh, sort of a rope-a-dope, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that's, and that's where we're at now. So we're in a state of confusion that's going to go on. It's going to hit the markets very hard. And then we're going to enter into a very large deflationary event in early uh, 2017 that will, um, uh, Royal the country in, uh, sort of a temporal echo of what happened when, uh, right after Reagan was inaugurated. In your report, I noticed that you said something about uh, government employees getting fired or committing suicide and bankers being dismissed and fired. Um, Are are you seeing that there's going to be a wave of, let's say, cleaning house and people getting scared and jumping ship? Is that what you're talking about? Cor- correct. That is, uh, that's true uh, more in the um, civil service side, more in the government side of that particular statement. Uh, so, yeah, that's the, um, uh, the motivation on that part of it is um, not cleaning house, but 